Diana with Folksy Tales. Welcome. On this channel, I talk about stories, in particular folk tales, beliefs, and mythologies. I apologize if I'm still a little nasally. The reason I didn't post last week is because I got sick and I'm still a little sick, but to make up for not posting last week, I'm posting today. Again, on Sunday, I will be posting a Japanese legend. Today, we are talking about the fairy tale, The Devil's Three Golden Hairs. This is a German story by the Brothers Grimm and is all about how you really should not tempt fate. So, once upon a time, there was a baby born to a very poor woman. And when he was born, he had a call or a kind of membrane over his head. And this was a sign that he was going to have great fortune, great luck in his life. And because of this, it was predicted that when he turned 19 years old, he would marry the king's daughter. And it just so happened that not too long after his birth, the king was just riding his horse through this random village, apparently on his own without any great escorts. <laughs> And when he came to this village, he heard this miraculous story of this special baby with the call, and the baby was going to marry the princess. Being that the princess was his own daughter, he decided that um, he needed to do something about this unwelcome little suitor, this innocent little baby that had just been born. So he went to the peasant's house and was very kind and genial and told them, let me take your baby. I will take great care of this special baby. And of course, like any normal parents, they said, no, you can't have our baby. But he offered them a lot of money, a lot of money, and said he would take the best care of this precious little baby. And they thought, well, you know, it's been predicted he's going to have great luck. He's going to have a great life. This must just be the start of it. We're going to give him to this rich man to be raised as nobility. And they agreed. And so the king took the little miracle baby and rode off with him. And being the nasty thing that he was, the king put this innocent little baby in a box, rode far enough away that nobody would see, and tossed him into the river. And he thought to himself that this was a good thing. He had done this for his daughter. It was the right thing to do. Yeah. However, unbeknownst to the king, little miracle baby floated down the river like baby Moses and ended up getting kind of stuck at a wheel well at a miller's house. And it just so happened that one of the employees was outside just hanging out and saw this little box stop at the well. And he thought, well, this is special. This little box is floating. It's not wet at all, it seems. There must be something valuable in there. So he fished it out and brought it to the miller who opened it and was amazed to find this perfectly happy, healthy little baby just in this box that had been tossed in the river. And it just so happened that the miller and his wife had been wanting children for quite some time and had been unable to conceive. And so they thought, this is a miracle from God. We've been given this little baby to take care of because we wanted a child so badly. And they took him in and they decided to raise him. And because he was a little God sent baby, they raised him with great grace and care. And he grew up to be not only very clever, but very good hearted. Years later, sometime after the boy's 19th birthday, the king happened to be doing his thing where he just rode around his country without any guards or attendants. And as he passed the mill, a terrible thunderstorm caused him to have to stop and take shelter. He took shelter in the mill, and of course the miller and his wife felt very honored that the king was there. And the king happened to see this strapping, handsome, very tall young man and just curiously asked, oh, is that your son? And the miller replied, oh no, that's, that's our miracle boy. He was found in the river and he was just a blessing to us and we've raised him all these years. And putting two and two together, thinking of where he was and 19 years, baby, box, river, the king realized, oh, this is the kid I tried to kill. I guess it survived. And now he had to come up with a very hasty plan B, lest this innocent young man 
try to marry the princess. So in his infinite kingliness, he thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a letter to my wife and give it to the kid to take to the castle. This letter is going to read, dear queen, kill the boy carrying this letter immediately, right now. By the time I get home, he better be dead and buried. The king wrote this letter and then went to the miller and told him, I have a task for your son, if that's all right. You know, I'll pay him a gold coin. And the miller said, oh, of course, you're our king. We'd be honored to do anything for you. And so he had his adoptive son take the letter and set off. However, leaving the mill, the boy soon became lost in a very dense forest that was around the area. And after wandering around all day, he just couldn't find a way out. So he happened to, at dusk, see a light that he then followed to a cottage. And when he got to the cottage, he knocked and asked the woman inside if he could spend the night. The woman responded that he was actually in the home of a bunch of robbers and that when they got back, they were going to kill him if he tried to stay. And he told her, well, I'm doing a very important mission for the king. I have to deliver this letter to the queen and I'm not really scared of robbers and I'm really tired. So I'm just going to stay here. You know, it's fine. There's a bench. There's a fire. Just, you know, I'll be fine over there. I'll sleep. Not long later, the robbers returned, and as the woman thought, they were furious at this young man who just brazenly decided he was going to sleep in their house. But the older woman calmed them down and told them, he's on an important mission, he's so tired, come on, just leave him alone. The robbers, still not sure, took the letter that he had uh, told the woman he was carrying and read it. They learned what the king was trying to do, and they thought, you know, we're criminals, but we're still not okay with this. You know, he has no idea what's coming. And so they wrote a new letter and they put it in the envelope. A new letter which read, Dear Queen, the kid that carries this letter is going to marry our daughter immediately. As soon as he gets to the castle, have them married. I want it all done and they should be happily wedded by the time I get home. And they put this new letter in the old envelope and then let the kid spend the night. The next morning, they had him get up, they handed him his letter, which I guess he, he didn't question, and then they told him the fastest way to get to the palace from their little house. So he followed their directions, got to the castle, and gave the queen the letter. And the queen, who apparently had no problem, just, I don't even think it was the same handwriting, but she didn't seem to care, she ordered the wedding immediately, and a great feast took place, Everyone was invited. I guess the king was still out wandering. He wasn't there yet, so he didn't get to witness this. But the princess was pretty happy because this young man was very handsome and he was nice. And she was like, yeah, you know, I could do worse. However, when the king returned, he was furious, especially at the queen. He demanded to know why she hadn't done what the letter said. How, how dare she let this peasant boy marry their daughter, especially without him there. And the queen was like, whoa, I did what you told me to do. Here, here's the letter. And of course the king read it, saw that it was not the same letter, didn't question his wife any further. I guess everyone just does what they're told when they receive a letter. But he called the young man to him and demanded to know when he had switched the letters, what had happened. This is not the original letter. And the young man responded truthfully, I don't know. I didn't see anyone switch a letter. The only thing that could have happened, you know, I did spend the night in this nice little cottage with this lovely family, but I wasn't awake if they did anything to it. The king, not having any real reason to punish him for this, told the boy, well, okay, but anyone that marries my daughter has to do this special thing that I totally did not just make up right now. Whoever marries my daughter has to go and get three golden hairs from the devil's head. And if you can't do that, you cannot stay married to her. And the boy just said, okay, well, if them's the rules, them's the rules. I'll go get those hairs for you. Be back soon. And he took off. The first stop on his trip led him through a very large town. And when he got to the gate of that town, the guard stopped him. And they said, you know, we need some information before we let you in. You know, what's your name? What's your job? How much do you know? 
because I guess asking someone how much they know is common practice before entering a village. Can't be too educated, you might scare people. And the boy responded his name and he simply said, I know everything. That's what I do. I know everything. And they said, okay, well, if you know everything, you need to answer an important question for us. There is a very special fountain that our master has. And for many years, this fountain has flowed with wine, but recently it has become completely dry. Not even water comes from it. And we don't know why. So answer that if you know everything. And he responded, well, let me into the city. I'm going somewhere. When I come back, I'll answer you. And they do. Spends the night, he moves on. The next town he comes to, something very similar happens. He stopped, he's asked this information, and he responds again that he knows everything. This time the guards ask him, well, if you know everything, our village has a very special apple tree that bears golden apples. But for the past few years, it has borne no fruit at all, just leaves. Why is this happening? And the boy responds, let me stay here tonight, let me pass through, and I will tell you on my way home. And they agree. Next, he moves on, and to get to his destination, he must cross a river. At this river, there is a ferryman, and the ferryman again asks these questions, because I suppose that is the common greeting in this area. What's your name? What's your job? How much do you know? Again, the boy responds that he knows everything, and the ferryman asks, well, if you know everything, tell me this. Why must I stay in this boat all day, every day, and ferry people back and forth without rest? Why can't I leave? And again, the boy tells him, let me cross. When I come back, I will tell you. And so he does. The boy has crossed the river, and the ferryman lets him off on the other side where there is the Black Forest, a very large and dense forest in Germany. And the boy enters the forest, searching for a specific spot where there is a cave in which lives the devil. Now the young boy enters the cave without fear, as soon as he finds it, and he finds the devil is not home, but his old mother is. She's sitting by the fire. And when the old mother sees this boy, she looks at him and says, you don't look wicked enough to be a devil. What are you doing in here? To which he responds, well, I need three hairs from your son's head or I can't stay married to my wife. And the old mother thinks to herself, well, that's interesting. Okay, I'll help you. Without really asking much in return, she decides to help him. But she says, you must trust me if I am to help you. And he agrees. So she turns him into an ant and tells him to hide in her dress and to wait and she will help him. But as a little ant, he says to her, Oh, also, I have three questions. You think you can help me out with that? And she says, well, what are they? So he asks her, why is there no wine flowing from the fountain in the first town? Why is there no golden apples in the second town? And why is the ferryman outside the forest forced to stay on his ferry? To which she responds, hmm, okay, let's do this. Stay quiet, stay hidden in my dress, in your little ant form and listen very carefully when I speak to the devil when he returns. If you do that, you'll have everything you need. And he agrees. And after he hides, a little time passes and the devil returns home. As soon as the devil returns home, he smells the air around and says to his old mother, who's here? I smell, I smell man. There's, a, there's someone in here. And he starts tearing apart the house looking for an intruder, which makes her a little angry and she snaps at him you're always smelling this and that. There's no one here. Look what you did. You just wrecked this house that I spent all day cleaning. Come on, clean up, sit down, eat your dinner. And because even devils listen to their mothers, he does as he's told, tidies up, sits down, and then yawns like he's very tired. And so she invites her son over to put his head in her lap and to snooze. As soon as he falls asleep with her soothing him, she grips one of his hairs and pulls. He wakes up with a roar, demanding to know why she did that. Why did she just rip out one of his hairs? But she acts surprised and says, oh, I'm so sorry. I just had a terrible dream and it made me jump and clutch your head out of fear. And he says to her, what kind of dream did you have that, that made that happen? 
And she said, oh, well, I had a dream that there's this, this special house and there's a fountain and it used to have wine, but now it's so dry and everyone is so sad. What could be causing such a thing? And he responds, well, what the people don't know is that there's a toad under a stone at the bottom of the well. That's what's causing the fountain to run dry. And if they killed the toad, the wine would flow again. Don't pull my hair again. And she says, okay, yeah, sorry, thank you. Okay, come here, come on, lay down. Starts to rub his head again, soothing him, and he falls asleep. Then she plucks out a second hair, and this time he awakes furious and demands to know, what is wrong with you? Why are you keep doing this to me? And she just calms him down again, saying, I'm so sorry, you know, I can't help it. I keep having these weird dreams. You know, this one was weird too. And he asks, what is it this time? To which she tells him, this time I had a dream about a beautiful tree in a field outside this village. And it used to have these lovely golden apples, but now there's no fruit at all. What could cause such a thing? And he responds, well, what the people of the village don't know is that there is a mouse gnawing at a root of the tree. And if they don't kill the mouse, the tree is going to die. And she says, oh, thank you. It makes me feel so much better. Okay, come, come lay down. And he looks at her and says, if you do that again, I am going to box your ear. I'm going to smack you upside the head. To which she says, oh, of course not. You know, bad dreams happening twice. What are the odds? Lay down. It won't happen again. But of course it does. She snatches out that third hair and this time he gets up and starts trashing the house again, furious. But because she's mom, she manages to calm him down again. And he whirls around and demands to know, what is wrong with you? What are these dreams? Like, why is this happening? What is it this time? And she said, oh, I think this was the last one. I'm so sorry, son. It's just you know, outside of our forest, there is this man on a boat and he's forced to ferry people across every day. Why is that happening to this poor man? And the devil responds, well, if he would just give the oar to someone else, he would be free. Are we good now? Can I actually go to sleep? And she says, oh, of course, of course, come, come, you're good. And the rest of the night passes without incident. The next morning, the devil awakes peaceful, forgetting that his mom ripped his hair out a few times the night before and takes off to do whatever it is devils do during the day. The old mother takes the little ant out of her pocket or apron, wherever he was sleeping, and turns him back into the lovely young man. She then asks him, do you have what you need? And he said, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. He thanks her profusely. He takes the hairs and he leaves the forest. On his way home, he finds the ferryman, and the ferryman asks him, well, you're back? And the boy says, take me across first, and then I'll tell you. So the ferryman takes him across the river, and the boy tells him, all you must do is the next time someone you ferry across the river, hand them the oar, and then they will be forced to take your place, and you will be free. And the ferryman goes, oh, thank you. Okay, cool. And the boy continues on. The first village on his way home is the village where they're having the apple problem. And when the guards ask, he tells them, there's a little mouse at the root of that tree. Hurry up and kill it or it will kill the tree. And they do this. Soon enough, they start to see blossoms and the mayor of this town is so grateful that he gathers two donkeys laden down with gold and gives them to the young man as a gift for restoring their tree. Happily enough, the young man takes his donkeys, continues on the road the next day, and he reaches the larger town. The guards ask him, you're back, what's going on with our fountain? And he tells them, there is a toad under one of the stones at the bottom of the well. You must kill this toad, and then wine will flow again. Once the toad is killed and wine begins to flow, the lord of the town is so grateful that he finds two more donkeys and ladens them with gold. So the young man has four donkeys carrying as much gold as they can and three golden hairs from the devil himself when he rides back to the palace. The king is, of course, astounded. One, that he's alive. Two, that he has the hairs. And three, that he suddenly has 
this fortune that he's come home with. And he thinks, oh, I guess this whole prophecy thing's not so bad. Yeah, you know, okay, you can, you can stay married to my daughter. And then he goes further and asks, where did the gold come from? To which the boy responds, oh, well, when I got to the Black Forest, a ferryman took me across. And on the other side of the river, I found this sandy embankment and there was just tons of gold in there. So, you know, I dug a bunch up and the king asks, oh, can I, can I do that? If I go there, will I find gold? And the boy tells him, well, of course, yeah, there was plenty left. You know, I only had four donkeys, so, you know, there's more there. And the king immediately shoots out of the castle, which again, I guess is common for him. He just goes on these trips follows the boy's instructions and finds the ferryman. Upon taking him across the river, the ferryman waits until the last possible moment. When they reach the other side, he slaps the oar down in the king's hand and takes off free at last. The king is then stuck in eternal punishment for his wickedness, forced to ferry people across the river because everyone since that day knew better than to allow the king to hand them that oar. And that is the tale, The Devil's Three Golden Hairs. I hope my voice wasn't too off-putting. I could hear myself getting a little like pitchy now and then, so hopefully it's not too bad. I also realized that I have a lot more of my own personal input when I'm not feeling well. I guess my filter is not quite as high up when I have a headache and I'm not feeling great, so I hope that wasn't too annoying. But but just some thoughts about this one. This has been adapted into at least one movie that I was able to find. I think it's very possible that there are others. The actual idea of a child of prophecy, someone trying to kill the child, and then them coming back to fulfill the prophecy is in so many stories, it's hard to even, you know, count them down. Like Harry Potter's the first one that comes to mind. But of course, also the baby in the river motif is pretty strong here, I'm thinking. Moses, I'm thinking, was it Perseus whose mother and him were sent to see in the coffin? I think it was Perseus. And I have to say the most interesting thing when I was reading that I then verified when I did a little bit of research on this story is that it really felt like kind of two stories in one. There's the child of destiny kind of story at the beginning of the king trying to kill the baby, the baby coming back and fulfilling the destiny. But then there's also the um, Suter has to go on a mission kind of story to get his wife. And turns out I was kind of right when I was thinking that it felt like two stories because this story is actually classified as two different folktale types. There's a classification guide that I typically don't bring up because I feel like most people would think that's kind of boring or nerdy. But just out of curiosity, I checked and the two categories that this story falls into, that one is actually the Devil's Three Hairs, which I'm pretty sure was named after this story, but turns out that having to collect three hairs from something or someone, usually something or someone bad, its own theme in fairy tales. And the other fairy tale type, or the other folktale type, is the prophecy of a poor young man marrying a rich young woman. And if you're wondering what a call is, in this situation, um, the birth is what is known as en call, which is I guess the French way of saying with call. And it's basically a part of the amniotic sac. So the little bubble the baby is in inside the mom. And when the baby is born, the water doesn't break, the sac doesn't break, and the baby is born in like a little jelly bubble. And sometimes the baby is born with some of that um, membrane just over its head. And this happens less than one in 80,000 times. So this is very rare. And as shown in the story and in other sources I saw, this is seen as kind of a, a lucky thing because it's just really rare. And you know, it doesn't mean baby is better or worse. It's just medically something that happens. Another major thing that I saw and thought of was the crossing of the river, of course thinking crossing into the underworld, crossing the river Styx with Kara and the ferryman. And instead of having to pay, you know, for the journey, well, he did have to pay with information and than the king having to take the role as the ferryman as punishment. I thought that was super interesting. That also leads to the idea of the Black Forest in this story in particular being like the underworld. I saw a couple sources that kind of compare the Black Forest or at least the, the cave in the forest 
as being the underworld or hell where the devil lives that he has to go into and that plays into the hero's journey the archetypal story cycle of many heroes in which part in which there is a part where the hero has to go to the underworld and face death and then return and for this this boy it's facing death the hands of the devil of course he doesn't die he gets what he needs he comes back then as i've mentioned in other stories and of course in my video there is the rule of three definitely at play here he has to answer three questions he gets three hairs so that is as in many stories present here i do wonder about the role of fate in this story it seems like fate is kind of what protected the baby and I kind of wonder if fate in this story is supposed to be representative maybe of God because the baby is, you know, protected in the river and then goes on to basically defeat, not physically, but like through, I'm not sure how you would put it, maybe through kindness or just goodness or just protection because why does the mother help him? We don't really know if it's just because he's kind and good or if he has some sort of divine protection, or maybe the mom is just really annoyed with her son at wrecking the cave every day when he comes home and has had a bad day. I don't know. But for whatever reason, he does defeat the devil. He gets the information and he gets what he needs. So he wins, even if the devil doesn't even really know he's there. So it makes me wonder if like fate in this situation is supposed to be God or not. I'm not sure, let me know what you think. But those were kind of my thoughts. I like the story because there is a clear uh, punishing of the wicked creature. The princess ends up with a lovely young man who is kind and good. And I hope that he gets to see his birth parents again. It would be kind of unfortunate if he doesn't. Maybe they'll go to the castle because they knew that he was supposed to marry the princess at 19. That would be nice. But I just realized I'm not wearing two earrings. <laughs> I'm going to end it on that note so I can go take a nap. I hope you enjoyed this story. I hope you understood it. Like, I'm not quite sure how my voice sounds on camera, but nevertheless, I really appreciate you being here. When I go to film the video for Sunday, I'm going to film it tomorrow. Hopefully my voice is a little better. Hope you'll join me then for the Rokurukubi story. That one's going to be super interesting. It's about a headless yokai, so that'll be cool. Let me know what you think. Again, thank you for spending some time with me here today, and I will see you next time.